Hi, everybody. Welcome back to VMware Explorer 2023. We're live here, and we've got a super panel coming off our super studio with a bunch of thought leaders from IBM. Scott Baker's here. He's the Chief Marketing Officer and VP of the IBM Infrastructure Business. To my left is Pete Bray. He's the Global Product Executive for IBM, and Brandon Mann is the Product Management Leader for Storage Fusion for IBM. What's in that shirt, Brandon? What do you got there? We got a little Watson, Watson X. X we're right. representing. We, 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 in our Super Studio event, the, the IBM Storage Summit that we had uh, last month, actually. Wow, it seems like just yesterday. It does. Yeah. We had a fantastic you know, day long. We had, uh, we had Vincent Chu on talking about Watson X, just sort of educating and hopefully inspiring people about the future of data and storage and what's possible in AI. And um, so Scott, I mean, it's been an amazing summer. I think the busiest summer I can remember. Right? right? And so, but we're here at VMware, right? You guys have had a long, long relationship with we have. VMware Explore. How's the show been for you? So I think the show has actually been really great. Uh, the foot traffic has been pretty amazing. I think the graphics that we've seen here uh, have just really upped the game from what I've seen previously, but more so the content. It was really interesting to kind of see the focus to your point around you know, generative AI as being one of the foundational, no pun intended, but sort of, yeah. one of the foundational topics that they're having here and how you can take advantage of you know, maybe what virtualization or containers can do for the purchases that you make in the infrastructure to host those AI-based workloads, especially as you begin to think about the workload all the way down to the bottom of the stack. Yeah, and, and the big three themes that we've been talking about here all week, you know, Broadcom, obviously the M&A piece, multi-cloud, which you know, kind of near yeah. and dear, Pete, to, to your heart, and of, and of course AI. And as it relates to the, the M&A front, you know, we've said, look, under Broadcom, there'd be much more focused. We don't expect that, that VMware is going to go out or Broadcom is going to go out and you know, buy some AI company like a Databricks did or a Snowflake did. Rather, they're going to look to partners like you guys, right? Brendan, I mean, that's where potentially you can add value. If you think about what VMware has announced, you know, they got a lot of work to do. Private AI, um, that's sort of your wheelhouse. <laughs> yeah. So how do you see that playing out and what role do you think IBM can play with customers? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's just a lot of excitement over generative AI overall and it's, it's, going, to be, it's going to be a momentum shifter in the industry in general and I think each one of the uh, companies are going to have a part to play in that. IBM definitely, you know, from, a, from an infrastructure standpoint, we're going to have a big part in it. And then obviously with Watson X, we have a huge aspect of what we're trying to accomplish from, you know, a, uh, AI for business aspect, right? So a lot of the same, same topics that uh, were discussed under the keynote, I think that they're, you know, right in line with a lot of the pieces yeah. that we're focused on. And I think that there's a lot of opportunity for partnership there. And Pete, the other big theme is multi-cloud. Yeah. Um, we kind of showed up and everybody had multiple clouds. Yeah. That oops, now we got to <laughs> clean this up. Um, obviously, you with your Red Hat heritage know a lot about that. Um, and, and customers are starting to get more deliberate about solving sort of that multi-cloud complexity. VMware obviously is a partner, wants to, to play there. Uh, but, but, but customers need to simplify so that they can, they can invest in new initiatives like AI. It, absolutely, and we're seeing that. You know, we're seeing the, the maturity level as people approach these problems, the multi-cloud problem, but even thinking beyond that, you know, towards, uh, you know, modernizing, but then moving towards transforming their businesses and using, using you know, multi-cloud, but growing into that next, you know, true hybrid cloud, or super cloud, as you like to talk about. We do. Um, but also, you know, the, the data and AI side of it, and the collision of those two, you know, moving towards transforming these organizations and how they operate, that's what's really, you know, interesting in what's happening right now. You know, Scott, one of the things we talked about in our super studio, the IBM Storage Summit that we had in our Palo Alto studio in, in July was, was ransomware. It was. And, and, you know, we see data protection as an adjacency to cybersecurity. I mean, it's not, you're not turning into a, you know, cybersecurity company, you know, in division right, right. now, but it's a, a key component. And, and one of the things, I, I make a couple of observations and you give me your, your thoughts. Pre-pandemic, it was all about DR. And, you know, once every 10 years, we're going to have a hurricane or a, right. a fire or some disaster and probabilities, like say, one in 10 years, and the impact is really bad. 
Now, all of a sudden, pandemic comes, post-pandemic, it's like the probability of a ransomware attack goes through the roof, and the impact is potentially just as bad, maybe worse. Um, so you've got this adjacency, ransomware protection, resiliency, whatever you want to call it, and you talk to customers about like, things like the NIST framework and the MITRE framework, and they sound really good, but they struggle to operationalize them. Right. But, but your ransomware solutions and what you're doing with customers is an example of how they can oper operationalize at least one piece of their cybersecurity strategy. They can test it, right. they can test recovery, and they can sort of check that box, if you will, and really get to the, the other part of their estate. But are you seeing that, that customers are aware of that and are beginning to operationalize that ransomware recovery to add business resiliency. Well, you know, look, Dave, let's connect the two topics together, right? You just talked about AI as being heavily data intensive. PD actually talked about the importance of mobility of both the, maybe the application stack as well as the data itself. And now you're bringing in this topic around, a, um, around ransomware, right? So what a perfect storm to come together. One of the things that we did release coming up to this event here was the notion of being able to do inline data corruption detection, actually using entropy to determine behavioral changes in the data set itself as it's transferring between the host and the backend storage array, and then responding appropriately, whether that is to alert someone or kick off uh, an automated runbook response. So as you begin to think about these large language models, um, which I think are interesting topics to bring about, but I think as businesses try to operationalize AI, you're going to see more focused, um, more focused repositories of data where the information that they're using to train the model are going to be verified and validated for accuracy and veracity, maybe even monetized uh, in terms of their relevance to the business itself. And I think those become the new attack surfaces that you know, ransomware will go after. Because I don't have to take the large language model down to have as an evil an effect, if you will, if I could just inject bad data into that. And so the importance of being able to use information and data-based entropy to determine behavioral changes in the pattern of how data is being shared from the host running that AI model to the back-end infrastructure and then taking appropriate action, that's going to set infrastructure vendors apart from you know, the run of the mill that's out there trying to do traditional, hey, we make big storage components for you. Uh, at IBM, our focus is don't just host the AI, bake the AI into the actual infrastructure itself. Yes, but entropy is winning right now. You get this randomness. It's, it's almost like people have said to me, chat GPT is actually getting worse. I'm like, well, yeah. Right, <laughs> you know? right. I mean, like, like, <laughs> like the digital gene pool is only so big for you know, chat GPT, and <laughs> after a while, you know, you'll start getting inbred responses from that model. So embedding AI into infrastructure you know, to make multi-cloud run better and right. infrastructure run better is, is kind of a no-brainer as well. You guys have a lot of experience in data. We, we built a uh, built we built a model, I guess you would call it, of um, of, a, of a of a power law for AI, and then the vertical axis was the size of the model. So you got these big models like you know ChatGPT and and Llama, et cetera. And then on the horizontal axis was domain specificity. Mm -hmm. And and the premise is you're going to have a long tail and a lot more of those. Yeah. Um, a lot of these power laws have no torso, but we think with open source you'll have that torso. But, but again, this seems to be sort of an area where IBM is going to be very strong, is that domain specificity, smaller models, but very focused, maybe more controllable, and to try to drive very specific business value. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, so, I mean, obviously that's a big play of what we're trying to do with WatsonX.ai mm -hmm. is really bringing the AI to your business domain, right? So being able to take those large language models, but then bringing them in-house and doing fine tuning on your own data. And we're very much involved in that from the storage and infrastructure yeah. aspect in that all of that is run on OpenShift, right? All of our Watson X, so we have the, the entire stack there from you know our Fusion offering, which we have Fusion HCI inclusive of GPU, so running that whole stack and being able to incorporate it in their own data center within the security of their uh, walls and bringing in their data to then fine tune those you know, large language models, where it's, whether it's Llama or other models that are coming out, but then fine tuning them with their own data uh, to make them you know, more, more attractive and 
differentiated from other uh, companies. And your strategy is to sort of be all of the above, right? You can get your own AI, you'll, you'll work with, with other open source tooling, yeah. optionality for customers is the theme. I want to confirm that, right? That's Absolutely. the strategy. Yeah, yeah so yeah. I think you heard it, think, right? So yep. our partnership with Hugging Face, I think very much <laughs> is leading the charge around, uh, you know, openness. And then you're going to do that across clouds. Yeah. Right. I used to think, you know, we, we, when we started playing around with SuperCloud, I used to think, all right, at some point the applications are going to run on multiple clouds, you know, glo single global instance. And then I sort of pivoted, s swung my pendulum brain and said, eh, maybe that's not going to happen. It's too complicated. Then AI comes in and it's like, well, maybe it is yeah. actually. Yeah. Yeah, and it's interesting how we might be able to use AI to work around some of the physical dimensions of that, you know, just speed of light problems, right? And being able to chop it up and, you know, take advantage of the hybrid cloud, the multi-cloud approach. I think that's really the direction that things will head. Yeah, and, and so you've got, you've now got the edge coming in as well. Right. And, well, and I think it's important to define what the edge is. Yeah, right? so let's, let's talk about that. Before you do that, it seems like the public cloud players have the advantage of you know, speed, innovation, all that, and, and then the sort of hybrid clouds, if I can call it that, like you know, I put you guys in that camp, have the advantage of understanding of legal, compliance, industry expertise, you know, true enterprise jobs, and then edge is this wild west. So how do you right. think about edge? How do you define, do, some people say, well, it's not necessarily a place. <laughs> it's sort of what is and isn't available at the edge. How do you think about it? I, you know, for me, uh, I think a lot of the times when we have conversations around edge-based computing, I like to think of it more as data center edge. Like, how far out can you extend the data center to the point at which not only can the data be collected, but also be processed away from sort of the core infrastructure that makes up whatever the organization is that you're supporting. Other people that you talk to may extend that edge all the way out to a sensor sitting on a tower collecting information. But the thing that's really important for me is the first point of collection and processing to me is truly the edge of the business, right? Otherwise, you just get one machine telling another machine, hey, the temperature is this and I'm okay, right? But the moment you can collect that data and process it, that's the key. Then to determine whether or not value can be deriv driven from it or it's just noise and we don't need it. I think that kicks off your data um, and AI sort of workflow to then determine does that data need to come back into the business. Okay, so wait, let me unpack that a little bit. So you're saying a lot of times it's just data's ephemeral, who cares, let it right. go. Right. Other times it's you're, you're inferring with AI and it, it, you need to take action. That's right. And so well, you need local processing power, you need low latency to do that, obviously low cost, uh, low power, and you, I think I'm inferring you're saying that's when you would persist the data. The determination of persistence needs to occur at the first point of ingest and process. Right. That's what I believe, right? And then that goes back somewhere, cloud or a data center, right. for, the, for the model, for the training, right? That's exactly right. Um, otherwise, you know, if you amass every bit of information, you're just asking the AI that you're training or the model that you're trying to put together to sift through all of that noise. So the more that you can do to clean the data up and really assign value or relevance to that information, at that point, that's when the initial stages of AI kick off, where it's making a determination based on how I've been trained, is this information valuable to the business, and then that kicks off this information supply chain upon which other models are going to work from. And then that modeling occurs somewhere, data center cloud, and then goes back out. Yep. And you have that virtuous cycle. Yep. I believe so. Do you think, so most of the, most of the AI today, I'm going to make a statement, tell me if I'm wrong. Most of the AI today is modeling that's done in the cloud. Modeling training. And over time, that's going to flip, and much more activity is going to occur, let's call it inferencing, I'll call it at the edge, mm -hmm. whatever, however we, we define that. Right, right. And there's going to be actually more data flowing. I'm not sure it's going to be more data persisted, but maybe it is. But it's almost like that will flip, where the activity will be distributed, and there'll be more happening inferencing at the edge AI than 
than maybe by the, maybe it's not even by the end of the decade. You guys, what do you think about that? Does that make sense to you or am I nuts? Yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense when you think about it from an efficiency standpoint. Mm -hmm. You know, everything that Scott is saying about, you know, at the point of ingest, make those decisions, you know, and do your inferencing at the edge. Um, I can totally see that that model, you know, will develop. Yeah, I would say, think about what you had said, like a lot of it has begun in the cloud. And if you think about that, the uh, access to large amounts of infrastructure and likely large amounts of data make it much more convenient to do that in the cloud versus trying to create the same experience on-prem. At IBM, from an infrastructure perspective, we like to talk about deploying cloud architectures on-prem or infrastructure that behaves like a cloud would and connects easily to different kinds of clouds. But the ability for me to spin up very rapidly a huge object-based backend storage uh, environment on-prem that's not already off-servicing some other workload might be a little bit difficult for businesses. So will that flip-flop? I think it will the moment that you begin to isolate and create data that has true relevance for whatever you're trying to do from an AI perspective. On-prem, there's absolutely no reason for any business to try to recreate the internet, you know, to have a large language model. That wouldn't make any sense whatsoever. But I think what AI is going to do is it's going to force um, higher degrees of data hygiene and responsibility for data onto people and organizations that they've not necessarily been as responsible for having to deal with and be thoughtful of uh, previously. Yeah, and you guys, uh, you guys have a lot of assets that you can bring to bear, whether it's infrastructure, file systems, AI, uh, partnerships that you own, like Red Hat. Um, <laughs> how does that all come together for your customers to drive value from an infrastructure standpoint, generally in an IBM you know, globally. You know, I know a couple of guys at the table that have good opinions about that. <laughs> I think Brandon could kick us off. Yeah, so I mean, I think that what most customers are looking for is they're looking for a solution, right? They're not looking for, you know, individual bag of parts, right? They're looking for how do, how do I accomplish what my, what my end goal is? How do I drive business value? And that's through the entire end-to-end -end stack and, and process. And I think that that's really where IBM thrives, right? We have we have the infrastructure, we have software, we have consulting, right? And we have great partnerships. So amongst all of those, you can bring them together and really offer a differentiated solution for customers. And that's what they're looking for, right? Is that integration point in a full full solution versus uh, individual pieces. And it's, and, and it's so true, Brendan. And, and unfortunately, a lot of those individual piece parts get, get purchased for whatever reason, because, oh, it's best of breed or it's shiny new toy, and then somebody's got to go clean it up. Anything you yeah. add to that, Pete? I mean, you talked about entropy earlier, and I mean, the challenge right now is the noise and you know, assembling these solutions and building them and then maintaining them over time is, is very challenging. And you know, that's one of the things that we're really focused on is building the complete solution but making it simple to consume. Um, it's just, there's so much change happening, you know, in, in all fronts with respect to AI, with respect to, you know, uh, generative AI, with respect to even modernization that's happening, and the demand there is that, you know, the skills, the technology, the technology's changing too quickly, the skills aren't keeping up, so the demand to make it simple and easy to consume is, is readily there, and that's why, you know, with the breadth of portfolio that we have, and we're really focused on how do we make that simple and democratize it. Yeah, I would extend that to say radically simple. How do we make it radically simple for people, right? The faster that you can deploy the appropriate type of you know, infrastructure component, whether it's physical or software defined, um, the better. And, and in fact, these two gentlemen here have done a tremendous job, even in the Watson X space, about in making sure that we include uh, available capacity for people via Ceph, or via the Fusion Foundation services, um, so that when you buy into Watson X, for example, you don't have to worry about where am I going to run this thing? They, the storage is baked in, it's ready to go for you. And I think that speaks to what Brandon has said around you know, solutions for people. Certainly they're parts when you look at them on the table, uh, but it's our job to make sure that we're presenting those useful kinds of scenarios where they can pull those parts together and actually deploy them to solve real world challenges. Yeah. The, the move to reduce IT labor started, you know, it's been going on forever, but it really, in earnest, when we started thinking about converged infrastructure, we started to attack that. But really, the goal is to eliminate yeah. <laughs> that. <in the> end, <laughs> yeah. Completely that agree. I mean, I think, I think successful infrastructure for AI is 
uh, infrastructure that is invisible. And it's hard for me to say that. It actually hurts the back of my throat <laughs> to say that. You twitched when you <laughs> yeah, said that. <laughs> but, but I mean, that's true because the more that you, you force the organization from an AI workload perspective to think about the backend infrastructure. Now, keep in mind there, there is responsibility to think about how you design it, but if you have to constantly be aware of it and you have to constantly you know, pander to it, then it sort of ruins the value that AI is supposed to bring for the business. Yeah. And if you can achieve that, it actually gives you a foundation to deliver that business value on top, which is, it's ultimately, I mean, the biggest nut, I think, is going to come down to reducing these mundane tasks that are going to reduce the, the need for people to do things that they don't want to do. Right. And does that mean, you know, job cuts? Maybe, maybe not, that's not really the point. The point is it's going to allow organizations to be much, much more productive. We're actually already seeing a little bit in the productivity numbers. You remember when you know, the, the PC revolution came, productivity went through the roof. And we've been starved for productivity you know, metrics in the last decade globally. And we're starting to see them pop up a little bit. That's the promise of AI. It's got to deliver that promise. You know? it's, if it doesn't, then there's going to be some real challenges economically, maybe socially. I don't yeah, know. you got to be careful, Dave. We may come to this table one day and there's just a screen in your place with questions that <laughs> pop up that we respond to. That's why you were smirking. <laughs> well, you know, if that happens, then there's going to be a role for me somewhere. That's right. <laughs> I better get creative. <laughs> Guys, thanks so much. Yeah, this thank you, great. you. Fantastic panel. Follow on to our Super Studio IBM Storage Summit, which is on thecube.net. Go to thecube.net for all of our videos, siliconangle.com for all the news. You're li we're live here, you're watching theCUBE from VMware Explore 2023, day two. Dave Vellante, John Furrier, Lisa Martin. We'll be right back. <laughs>